the exceeding weight of glory. Exodus 33, 18, Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. Then God must show his wisdom. He must show his justice, his loving kindness, his mercy, his holiness, his wrath, his patience, his long suffering and goodness, his largeness, his omniscience, his knowledge, his omnipresence. God must show all of this in order to show his glory. He must show his magnificence, his worth, his loveliness, and the grandeur of all of his perfections. All of these things which he displays to the whole earth, which is full of his glory. And the human eye cannot see some of the glory of God and live. The human eye can attest to the beauty and the marvel of nature, all of mankind, but we cannot directly in our human flesh look on the glory of God and live. We cannot fathom the full glory of God. The spirit of the Antichrist is the only one that can't give God his glory because Jesus is Lord. But those who don't believe that God is real should open their God-given eyes and just look around because the earth did not create itself any more than you or I created ourselves. Our parents, our parents couldn't themselves, neither did our parents create us because they didn't have a spare spirit to put into you or into me. And they didn't have the breath of life to breathe into us or to you, to make you or me a living soul. The whole earth is full of God's glory and creation cries his glory. And God is crowned with glory. He is the bright and morning star, Jesus, the rose of Sharon. He's altogether lovely and full of glory. The Holy Spirit speaks of the Father again of his glory. Psalm 19 and 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. So if we're supposed to be like Jesus, then God intends that man should show his glory as well. And so God gloriously shows us his presence in the pillars of glory, in the clouds of fire, and in all of nature. And God's glory so filled the tabernacle that the anointing of it was so heavy that the priests couldn't minister. This is Second Chronicles 5 and 14. The kabod of God's glory, the heaviness of it was so much that people couldn't stand under it. And so if somebody tells you you're a lightweight, and I'm not talking about boxing or MMA, they're really saying more than you think, because without glory, we are lightweights. Exodus 33 and 20, no man can see God's glory and live. You see, the front side of God's glory would have been too much for Moses, who was asking God to see his glory. So God mercifully let Moses see the backside of his glory. So God said to Moses, stand here in the cleft of this rock and you can see my glory as I pass by. The cleft of this rock, earth, the third rock from the sun. Is that part of why we're on earth to witness the glory of God in this rock? Or is it about Jesus, the mighty rock, the rock that is higher than I? Can we see the glory of God in Christ? Hear my cry, O Lord. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. This to me is awe-inspiring. So God's glory is amazing to us. It's too much for us to look straight at. God's glory is all around him. And God's glory follows after him. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. 2a, above it stood the seraphims. Verse 3, and one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah 
chapter 6, I began at verse 1. So the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth. Lord, your glory fills the heavens. The whole earth is filled with your glory. And you know how some people come in and suck the air up out of a room? Well, God is the air in the room. He is the life. He is the joy. He's the wisdom in any room, every room. He's the sweet smelling aroma. God is spirit and he is life. And God has showed his glory. He shows that his glory comes after and that the glory of the Lord filled the temple like the train of a majestic garment. Think of the train, for instance, on a wedding dress. A wedding dress averages, it weighs about seven pounds. A wedding dress with a longer train could weigh about 10 to 15 pounds. A wedding dress with a huge train on it would weigh up to about 40 pounds. Now, there is a story of a woman who had a wedding and things and it weighed 400 pounds of course she couldn't stand up under that but she put it on some kind of way but imagine how God's train must fill the temple the entire temple and what must the weight of that train be what must the weight of that glory be there is a glory that is due man there's a glory that is for man a glory that man carries and for all men, just for being created a little lower than the angels, we are set in a glory that the Lord graciously has given us. We are set in dominion. And there's a glory to that. And some men are called to and achieve more glory than others. For instance, in the Old Testament, Saul it slew, slew his thousands and David slew his ten thousands. So here's a clue. Whatever you're called to on the earth is an indication of what your authority is will be in in the earth and what authority you're going to walk in in glory listen here we do not have nothing to do we're here for a reason and it's going to determine our eternal destiny so in psalm 23 the verse says that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life goodness and mercy following after can you imagine that is a form of glory that is due man a proper leader will no doubt doubt have followers right so what follows you indicates who you are do you have evil and pestilence hate your strife following you or do you have goodness and mercy and truth and grace following you influencers have followers goodly followers are an indication of a glory on a man you know it's like when a man or a woman a person leaves a room and what is said about that man or that person after he leaves the room indicates his real reputation what people really think of him it indicates his real glory or the lack of glory so we all believe we want glory but what is the cost of that glory you know, like if you're on a boat and you're whipping around on your boat, the size of the wake that you leave is determined by how big your boat is and how you navigate and maneuver that vessel. So what comes after you is as important as what people see on your face. It's as important as what they see because you can't just give them a fake smile. There is something that surrounds you. There's a spirit, the spirit of God, hopefully, that surrounds you and envelops you. And that follows after you. It is the thing that people notice. It is the thing people remember. It is what they talk about after you've left their presence. Whether they're two-faced or not, people will say good things about you after you've left. If you have goodness and mercy following after you. I mentioned here in the New Testament that the hem of Jesus' garment could heal. That's how good Jesus was. And Paul's handkerchiefs could heal. His shadow. These are all things that come after a person. These are all things that follow a person. And if the shadow of a man can heal, what must his countenance be like? What is the ministry of his face? What is the ministry of your face? Glory to God. But shouldn't your glory, the glory you got from God, the glory of man heal something? help something help someone 
Can your glory do something, change something, change somebody? Can you change somebody's life? Amen. And of course, the wake of a boat doesn't heal anything. But it said that many can leave destruction in their wake. And in the book of the Revelation, it says that the devil with his tail took a third part of the stars from the sky. Revelations 12, 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and it cast them to the earth. Revelation 12, 4a. So the devil took a third part of the angels with him. So the devil's wake is his evil pointy tail. Jesus' garment healed the sick. And God's train filled the temple with glory. Who do you want to serve? So there is the promise of an eternal glory for believers. And for this light momentary affliction, that's our life. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. <clears throat> that promise is to keep us focused on the end result of traversing the earth. Because man's life is said to perish like a vapor. James 4.14, whereas you know not what you shall be tomorrow, but what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes. Oh, so quickly are we young and then suddenly old. But even though there can be many challenges along the way, it seems to go by quickly. So we must do the will of God, do the work of God while it is day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. King James Version. Psalms 34, 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. So our present troubles are small. They really, in the grand scheme of things, they won't last long. But they produce something in us. They work something in us. And they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs all of these afflictions and will last forever. So if you've been given a thorn in the flesh, as Paul complained, or you have life's irritations, count it all joy when you fall in to diverse temptations. I mean, don't seek them, but if it happens... Because these trials will increase your faith in, faith in God. They'll increase your prayer life. They will drive you to your knees. They will drive you to warfare prayer. They will drive you to victory. Many are the afflictions. Some of our afflictions are self-afflicted. And maybe you've decided to take the slow route to your life, in your life. Or you've decided to take the slow route this season to get from where you are to where God wants you to be. The slow train to glory. And I don't mean the end of your life. I just mean to getting to the place in God where he wants you to be. So you've decided to take the slow train and not the express train. Well, guess what? The slow train has a lot of stops on the way. Many stops. Sin stops. Every stop on the slow train is usually a sin stop. And that's what slows it down. That's what slows down the life of a man. I've done that before. I'm not proud of it. And it's like being late for work and you still have to stop at every stoplight. Or if you're taking the bus, you have to stop at every corner. Or you're taking the metro and there's a delay at every station. It just feels like you just can't get there. But if you caused it yourself, you have to repent. I have to repent. Ask God to please forgive us. And by the blood of Jesus, show us mercy. Remove the sin and this iniquity from us so we can move forward in the things of God. Why aren't we there already? Many times it's sin. Many times it's human delay. It's not God. It's us. And from Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land was supposed to take 11 days. Mm -hmm. Human delay. Human delay. You need to choose and purpose to come out of trials and tests and afflictions as soon as possible. But use your afflictions and your mistakes to grow in the things of God. Use them to learn and to grow spiritually. A wasted mistake is made again. A wasted mistake is made again. But just as in the natural, we don't chase or away or piffle away opportunities. 
Because sometimes a challenge may be more than just a challenge. It could be an opportunity looking you right in the face. Like, for instance, if you're at work and the boss wants you to be the acting boss while he's on vacation. Hmm. Your mind may think, well, is he using me or is he trying to see what I'm made of to give me a future promotion? You see, a promotion is glory, right? It's an indication that more trust has been placed in you and that you've passed a test or test and you're finally being acknowledged and rewarded. God is like that. I hope your boss isn't evil. Perhaps your boss is like that. Ask God. Because if you don't have wisdom and discernment to know this, then you are the person who should be praying. But if you trust God, you're more likely to trust people. And you'll do the acting boss thing. Go ahead and do it. Knowing that God's got this covered, no matter if it's there or if it's someplace else that God is planning to send you for promotion. Promotion ultimately comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. And a promotion is the glory that a man can enjoy right here on earth. And then there's glory. Man is not to touch God's glory. And you've heard people say, you want the truth? You can't stand the truth. You can't handle the truth. Well, I'm going to say this to you. You want God's glory? You can't stand under God's glory. None of us can. Second Samuel 6, 1, David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, cistrons, and cymbals when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon. And Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen that were pulling it stumbled. And I suppose you can say that Uzzah stumbled right then too because Uzzah touched the ark, the presence of God's glory, to try to steady it. But when the oxen stumbled, it made the ark tilt. So Uzzah was trying to steady the ark with his hand and that was in direct violation of divine law. And he was immediately killed by the Lord for this error. The oxen stumbled because of the weight of the glory of God in the ark. Or it could have been because of the primitive way that it was being carried by man. This is God's glory. And the glory of God is heavy. And the enemy puts stones and stumbling blocks in the paths of men. The glory is heavy and the road is rocky. And ultimately, the glory steadies you. The glory steadies you. It keeps you. You don't keep it. The glory is naturally balanced. But if you aren't balanced, you can't carry it. And I'm talking about the glory that God bestows on man. So naturally speaking, we must carry that glory on ground to probable rough places. You know, the rough side of the mountain where the glory of God is needed, where the presence and the gifts and the spirit of the Lord is needed and where we've been sent by God. But we are not to touch God's glory. And real talk, let me ask you this. If you had an actual, if you had actual real bona fide glory, whatever you believe that is, whatever you see that as, whatever you know that to be, who are you going to let use it? Touch it, borrow it, carry it around for you from place to place. Okay, now you understand why God's saying don't touch that. But when the person who's supposed to be carrying the glory of God is not doing their part, you might see a pastor or a minister or some leader and you just feel like they're just not doing their part. Judge not. Because you don't necessarily get to step in unless God says so. There's the glory that's due man, the glory of man. And that's fine to have that when it's bestowed upon you. But the man who's not doing what he's supposed to be doing has an Ahab spirit. And the woman who steps in to do what that man is not doing has a Jezebel spirit. And, you know, I should correct that. The Ahab spirit or Jezebel spirit are not necessarily gendered. They are not necessarily male and female. So I'm going to say it again. The person who is not doing what he's supposed to be doing has an Ahab spirit. And the person who steps in to do what the other person is not doing has a Jezebel spirit. 
Ahab wants the glory, but doesn't want the work. Jezebel will do the work by hook or crook, but Jezebel wants the glory. The problem is that glory is not for Jezebel and it's not for her or him. But you see, each of Satan's devils, each of Satan's demons and co-conspirators wants some aspect of what the devil wants. And that's why he employs those spirits. And that's why they enlist with him. And that's why and where it comes to witchcraft, manipulation, intimidation, domination and control and fake glory. Because the Jezebel spirit wants glory so bad. Satan wants glory so bad. They'll fake it. And fake glory is no glory at all. It has no godly eternal weight. And just like the golden Fort Knox is backing up the dollar bills, fake glory is only somewhat backed up by the devil who is inglorious because the devil fell from glory and he's probably been trying to get glory back ever since. Like people you know who want the things of God, but they don't want God and they don't want to be accountable to God. And for the record, that'll never work. It has never worked and it will not ever work. So the devil tries to fake the glory and this fake glory has no weight, no eternal weight. weight. But yet while Moses was up on Mount Sinai trying to get the Ten Commandments, Aaron and others were down in the valley creating a golden calf. They were saying, oh, bring us your jewelry and your gold and we'll make it, we'll melt it down and we'll make a fake God And we're going to create some fake glory at the base of this mountain, even while Moses is up on Sinai trying to get the laws of God for these people's lives. And I guess they said Moses was taking too long. And that's one of the things the devil wants from you. It's your glory. He wants you defeated, debased, ashamed, brought down, brought low and glorious like him down to the dirt. We talked about that in a previous message. When a man has to declare his own glory, it's no glory at all. This is Proverbs. And counterfeit glory is Jezebelish. I don't know if that's a word, but I liked it. Jezebelish. It is not good to eat much honey. And it's not good to seek honors for yourself. Because when a man has to declare glory, his own glory, it is not glory at all. Proverbs 25, 27. So we're not to covet or touch God's glory. But yet we see an account in Acts 12, 22. Herod gave a speech. And when he finished the speech, the people shouted, it's the voice of a God. It's not a man. And Herod loved that. But instead of giving God the glory, Herod delighted in himself. But God didn't. God's actions were prompt and disastrous. And he said, because he gave not God the glory. And he said, because he gave not God the glory. Then eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. And the angel of the Lord smote Herod. It was hammer time. God's thunder hammer. Don't touch that. So God's glory, his weight, the exceeding weight of God's glory. So when the glory of God falls on a person or on a people, it rather it blankets them. It could be described in the Bible as a mist or a fog, but it's heavy. And it's the exact reason why people fall down in prayer and deliverance services. And if you've never experienced the presence and the glory of God, it can knock you down. The presence of God has set me down and knocked me down before in my own house by myself more than once not in a judgmental or punishing way this was in worship the power of god is mighty it is real the power of god is one of the reasons i say god is not playing with any of us but as you get a little more used to his uh, the anointing you may be able to stand up uh, more and more under anointing i mean your knees may buckle sometimes you may wobble but believe me God is not releasing all of his glory on a human. They would not survive it. 
So the glory of God envelops a person. So when God looks, he sees that glory and there you are all wrapped up in it, you know, as an individual or as a people group. And that glory is heavy, like gold. It's like if you think of an M&M all wrapped up in that candy shell, just think of it, though, as it being enveloped in gold. And let's think you're the M&M, OK? It's not just gilded or coated or or just dabbed on or brushed on. It's fully encased, fully encased, fully enrobed in gold, a heavy gold. And glory is heavy for man. It's very heavy. And it's carried by your spirit, man, not by your flesh. God will not enrobe you with gold until your spirit is proved. And you need to be a workman, rightly dividing that word, spending time with God to prove your spirit. And the strength that is needed is the strength of spirit to carry God's glory. A strong spirit in man that communes with God and is directed by the Holy Spirit of God. It has strength of character and soul prosperity. You must be fully vetted by God first. Glory, God's glory is not to hide human flaws. God will hide us from evil persecutors. He will hide us from evil enemies. But we cannot hide from ourselves or mask sin behind this glory. There's no way you're going to be on that slow train to glory, stopping at every sin stop with glory on you. Impossible. And in the Old Testament, when the priest went in once a year to minister in the Holy of Holies, if they were unclean, if they were, had sinned at all, even during that whole year, they dropped dead. They went in with a rope on them. So if they didn't come out in a certain time, they had to be dragged out dead. God's not playing with any of us. So in the natural, we achieve certain successes and success and money. They say will reveal who you really are. But if there's glory on you, God already knows who you are. You've already been vetted by God. Hallelujah. So the glory is to protect the value of what's inside it's to encase it eternally at that moment for an honor or for that vessel to see its worth in God and in gold. And so when nations see you, they'll be very afraid because the glory of God is on you. Hallelujah. And those nations are the nations that want to pull you down in the spirit, demons, devils, Satan, the like, evil spirits, wickedness in high places. And when that glory of God is on you, the enemies of God will pass over you. They will pass by. So man can easily carry his own glory, the glory that's due man, you know, leaders and people in spiritual and religious positions, political positions, they carry it. And Jesus told them, give honor to whom honor is due. But when a man tries to carry glory in his flesh, it's going to be evident that it's fake. It's going to be in his swag and his buffness, his appearance, a woman in her beauty, in her flesh. And when a man or a woman tries to carry glory in their soul, it'll be evidenced by components of their soul, their intelligence or their very gracious emotions. But glory that's from God, the glory from God is comported by a man or a woman or that person in their spirit and by their spirit. And when you see a man, a woman, a person with an excellent spirit, an excellence of spirit, that's when you'll also see the glory of God on them. And whether if they deserve glory, that's between them and God. I wouldn't judge it. But God's glory is quite another thing. You see, sometimes God just lends us his glory. And sometimes it's fully given, still carrying and representing God, representing God's glory and carrying God's presence, the kingdom, the king's dome, the king's domain is God's presence. So now with excellence of spirit, we think like God, we talk like God, we do like God, we do what God would do and we do not do what God would not do. That is excellence of spirit. Father, thank you. 
Thank you that I'm redeemed by Christ Jesus and I'm redeemed for your glory in the earth. I am your workmanship created in your image and likeness for good works. Father, send your refining fire of the Holy Spirit and the purifying power of the blood of Jesus to cleanse me and make my whole life fit for the manifestation of your glory in Jesus' name. Father, destroy and consume by fire everything that blocks your glory in my life in Jesus' name. Father, baptize me afresh with the Holy Spirit of promise in the name of Jesus. For your spirit, your Holy Spirit is the spirit of glory. And Father, let me not grieve the Holy Spirit as I go through the process. And I declare that my star and my light is shining so bright before men that they will see God's good work, your good work in my life, Father, and they'll glorify you. Father, thank you for the spirit of boldness and courage to act on this glory that you put in my spirit in the name of Jesus. And Father, I declare, Jesus declared, yes, Jesus declared that as you have sent him, so you have chosen me and you've also sent me. And now, Lord, I pray for grace to stand up and respond to this call with a yes in the name of Jesus. Lord, perfect those things that concern me and your mercy endures forever. Forsake not the work of your own hands. And Lord, as I prosper and I'm in health, even as my soul prospers, I thank you, Lord. And I decree and declare that I am walking in power, walking in miracles and favor. And the Lord is showing forth signs and wonders in Jesus' name. And Father, your word declares that I'm a priest and a king to you. And I pray for understanding to act out my kingly and priestly duties and responsibilities, rights and privileges on the earth in Jesus' name. And I'm sure that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Thank you, Father, for hearing and answering prayers, my prayers our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.